Hey everyone, Ryan here, and welcome to our practice questions video for the head and neck anatomy series. Uh, this is everything that we talked about in this video series, and if you haven't already, I would definitely encourage you to go back and watch all of these videos before attempting these questions to give you the best chance of doing well. Now I broke down the material covered on the board exam into 19 videos of high yield information. And this information will really help you on the board exam, especially the information about the muscles of mastication, facial expression, and tongue innervation. Now I've compiled 15 questions for us to go through together, and these will be very similar to what you see on test day. So keep track of how you do, and let me know in the comments once we're done. All right, so enough with that, let's get started with question number one. And now that we're working on the integrated board exam, I've included a patient box with many of these practice questions, so you get some practice on working through them. Now this is the board exam's way of presenting information about a patient case. It's standardized, it looks the same every time it's presented on the board exam with these four sections. Now sometimes one of these four sections, or maybe two of them will be left blank, but most of the time there's some information in all of these sections. All right, so go ahead, uh, read through this question, and think through the answer choices, and then we'll go over it together. All right, so this one says, which muscle is most likely failing to act properly in this case? Now, most of the time when I have a case question on an exam, I would read through the question first, then I would skim through the patient box, and then I would go to the answer choices. It's typically the order I do things. You could skim through the patient box first and then read through the question, but I would typically wait until at least going through both of those before going through the answer choices. So we're looking for something muscle related. We're going through the patient box. They're here for routine checkup. A lot of this information is extraneous. We don't really need it to solve the question, but this is pretty important during our oral cancer screening, the patient's unable to protrude her tongue. So this is talking about tongue muscle and their action. So if we go through the answer choices, all four of those are tongue muscles. And we just have to think about what are those muscles particular actions. Well, the hyoglossus depresses the tongue, the styloglossus retracts the tongue, the palatoglossus elevates the posterior part of the tongue, and the genioglossus protrudes the tongue forward. Now since the patient's unable to adequately stick her tongue out while you're doing an oral cancer screening, you can presume that the genioglossus is failing to act properly because its action is responsible for sticking the tongue out and the patient's unable to do so. So the answer for this first question is D, the genioglossus is failing to act properly. All right, question number two. The facial nerve exits the skull through which foramen? Go ahead, pause the video, think through this question, then we'll go over it together. Okay, so although we didn't talk about the stylomastoid foramen specifically in our videos, we learned what passes through the other three foramina. And this is an important lesson for the board exam. Sometimes you'll see something that you just never heard of before, but typically if you've gone through all of the high yield things that we talk about, you'll have enough information at your disposal to answer a question, even if there's something in the question stem or in the answer choices that you just haven't heard of before. You could at least rule out or rule in the correct answer by recognizing everything else. So for here, we know the uh, foramen rotundum, V2, the second division, second branch of the trigeminal nerve traverses rotundum. Ovali uh, is going to transmit V3, as well as the lesser petrosal nerve. The stylomastoid foramen, well, let's skip over that one for now and go to the jugular foramen, which tr transmits uh, cranial nerves 9, 10, and 11. But the answer, the question is talking about the facial nerve, cranial nerve seven. And so it doesn't really seem to fit with any of these, A, B, or D. 
And so the facial nerve actually enters from the brain to the base of the skull through the internal acoustic meatus, and then it exits the skull through that stylomastoid foramen. So the answer for this question is in fact C. That's the little stylomastoid foramen. And we could pick that answer because we could rule out everything else. Rotundum, ovale, and fr the jugular foramen did not transmit the facial nerve from when we learned those foramina. So again, important lesson. You may not recognize everything, but you usually have enough information to answer it correctly. All right, question number three. Which bone, along with the maxilla and zygomatic bone, form the floor of the orbit? Go ahead, think through this question, and then we'll go over it together. All right, so let's go through these answers one at a time. The nasal bone is not part of it. It's typically included as a distractor option when talking about the orbit because it's close by, but it's not technically a part of it. So we can rule that one out immediately. The sphenoid bone is part of the posterior wall of the orbit, but not the floor. So that one we can rule out as well. The ethmoid bone is part of the medial surface of the orbit. And the palatine bone is contributing the smallest component to the orbit, but it is an important portion nonetheless, as it does involve part of the floor. So D is the correct answer. And you can see that the palatine bone, that little teal part, along with the zygomatic and maxilla, are forming the floor of the orbit. Okay, question number four. We're back to our patient boxes. So which muscle is activating in this patient to produce the facial expression you noticed? Go ahead, pause the video, read through that patient box, and we'll go over the question together. Okay, so this is another classic uh, muscle action question. These come up uh, a little, little more often than some of the other uh, head and neck anatomy things that we've went over before. So which muscle is activating in this patient? Well, again, we can go to the patient box and figure out what the question stem is talking about. And this is pretty common when you're preparing to administer local anesthetic. The patient may not be thrilled, and you observe that they're wrinkling the bridge of their nose. And so we go through the answer choices and think about which of these muscles could be uh, resulting in that action. Well, the mentalis is responsible for uh, pouting the lower lip, it contributes to mentalis strain, uh, doesn't have anything to do with the nose. So we're going to rule that one out. The nasalis compresses the nasal cartilage. It also depresses the tip of the nose and elevates the corners of the nostrils. So it does have to do with the nose, but not the bridge, which is between the eyebrows. So we're going to rule that one out as well. The orbicularis oculi closes the eye in both a smiling and frowning, but again, doesn't have anything to do with the bridge of the nose. And that leaves us with the proserus, which does in fact wrinkle the bridge of the nose right between the two eyebrows. So the correct answer for this question is C. Now I almost included the corrugator supercilii muscle as a distractor option of these answers because it's very similar in action to the proserus, but it draws the eyebrows together, which is often paired with wrinkling of the bridge of the nose. So know that on a board exam, they might include the supercilii muscle if this question were asked, but I chose to avoid including that as a possible answer choice because they are very similar in action. Question number five, the pterygo maxillary fissure separates the maxilla from what bone posteriorly? Go ahead, pause the video, and then we'll go over this together. So the pterygo maxillary fissure is that teardrop-shaped hole located at the back of the maxilla, above and behind the tuberosity. So pterygo maxillary pretty much gives you the answer. The maxilla is in the front of this fissure, and the pterygoid process is in the back. So if you know which bone, includes the pterygoid process, you know this answer. And so the bone here that includes 
the pterygoid process as well as the pterygoid plates is the sphenoid bone. And so if we look at this image from our videos, this is the sphenoid bone and it's forming that posterior border for this teardrop shaped pterygomaxillary fissure. Okay, question number six. Which two nerves carry taste sensation from the tongue? So go ahead and pause the video and then we'll go over this together. All right, so tongue innervation, like I said at the beginning of this video, is one of the most important things you could take away from this entire series. So we definitely, definitely have to be familiar with this. So the question is specifically asking about taste sensation. And if we draw our tongue diagram, and we have the anterior two-thirds, the posterior third, and then we have our root or base of the tongue, we can fill this in with the information from our videos. And so for touch sensation to the anterior two-thirds, that is the trigeminal nerve, specifically the third division of that trigeminal nerve, and even more specifically, the lingual nerve of V3. However, that's touch sensation, and we're concerned about taste. So the lingual nerve, although it sounds correct, is not what we're looking for in this answer. As far as taste from the anterior two-thirds, that's the facial nerve, specifically corda tympani. And so I like this answer choice already. And then for the posterior thirds, that is the glossopharyngeal nerve for both taste and touch sensation. And so glossopharyngeal nerve is also correct. So C is the correct answer. And then just for fun, D has this part correct, but the hypoglossal nerve is responsible for muscle action of the tongue, not taste. So the answer here is C. All right, question number seven. This patient is unable to protrude her mandible more than 10 millimeters. You suspect no muscle or joint disorders. What ligament is most likely involved with this finding? Go ahead, pause the video, and then we'll go over this together. So again, it's always good practice to read the question first, then read through or at least skim the entire patient box, and then go through the answer choices. Now in this case though, there's a whole lot of information in this box about uh, condylar injury, suspected facial trauma, and resultant asymmetric growth that I would call a red herring. This is information that you don't need to answer the question. And this will happen on the exam. The vast majority of the time, there's certainly information in here that you need, but on rare occasion, it's just extraneous information that might try to even throw you off. So just keep that in mind when you're reading through these. The normal protrusive movement for an adult or even an adolescent patient would be somewhere between 5 and 12 millimeters. So this 10 millimeter finding is well within normal limits. There's nothing pathologic going on here. And the key is they're unable to protrude the, mandib the mandible more than. So we're looking for a ligament that is specifically limiting protrusion of the mandible. So we can run through these ligaments in the answer choices and figure out which is the best fit. The discal ligament or collateral ligaments help the condyle and disc travel together and they also separate the upper and lower joint spaces. Nothing about limiting movement of the, joint, of the jaw though, so we'll rule that one out. The stylohyoid ligament runs from the styloid process to the hyoid bone, actually doesn't attach to the mandible at all, and it's calcified and symptomatic in Eagle syndrome, but doesn't limit movement of the mandible, so we'll rule that one out as well. The sphenomandibular ligament is an important one. It supports the mandible, but it doesn't actually limit its movement. So we can rule that one out as well. And the stylomandibular ligament that goes from the styloid process to the angle of the mandible does limit movement. It's the culprit for the finding why we don't just have the mandible protruding 12, 15, and 20 millimeters because it prohibits that mandible from stretching beyond a certain point. 
So the answer in this question is A. All right, question number eight. The masseter muscle originates from what skeletal structure? Go ahead and pause the video and then we'll go over this together. All right, so this is a nice straightforward muscle question and it's really just pure rote memorization. The masseter muscle is one of those main muscles of mastication, so it's absolutely fair game for the board exam. The infratemporal crest is the origin of the superior head of the lateral pterygoid muscle, not the masseter, so we can rule that one out. The lateral pterygoid plate is the origin for both pterygoids, depending on the surface, medial for medial pterygoid and lateral surface for lateral pterygoid muscle, so we can rule that one out as well. And the mandibular angle is perhaps the most tempting of these incorrect choices, and it's the insertion of the masseter, but we're looking for the origin, so this is also incorrect. The correct answer here is zygomatic arch, and that is where the masseter attaches. All right, question number nine. Which of the following muscles is least likely to be activated during a smile? Go ahead, pause the video, and then we'll go over this one together. All right, so all of these muscles except for one is involved in smiling. The orbicularis oculi that surrounds both eyes is involved in squinting of the eye, which does happen during, during a Duchenne or candid enjoyment smile. So that is incorrect. It does actually activate. The rhizorius muscle is one of those smiling muscles as well. It pulls the corners of the lip laterally, particularly during a grimace. That's also incorrect. The zygomaticus major is perhaps the main smiling muscle. That one is definitely incorrect. And the elevator anguli oris elevates the corner of the mouth on both sides. And so that's definitely going to activate during a smile, pulling up the corners of the lips. So that is also incorrect. And perhaps ironically, the orbicularis oris that surrounds the mouth is actually the only one that's activated uh, not during a smile here. It's only activated during puckering and frowning. So the orbicularis oris is maybe counterintuitively the correct answer for this question. It activates during a frown, but not during a smile. All right, question number 10, go ahead and read through this question and the patient box, and then we'll go over it together. So which salivary duct is most likely involved in the condition responsible for her bad taste? So what are, what are they talking about? Let's go to the patient box and find out. So we have an uh, older female patient, my mouth feels very dry, have a bad taste, difficulty swallowing, strange tasting saliva, and difficulty keeping her dentures in place. Fully edentulous, complete upper and lower dentures, and, oh, this is interesting, reveals a radiopaque mass consistent with sialolithiasis. So, older patient, sounds like maybe she has Sjogren's syndrome, or maybe it's a side effect of polypharmacy, we don't know why she has a dry mouth, and frankly, we don't care. We don't need to know. But what's important is this, the sialolithiasis. It's a calcification in a salivary gland duct. And the submandibular gland has the highest predilection for sialolithiasis with about 80% occurrence rate, followed by the parotid gland at about 19%, and then sublingual glands for the remaining 1%. But the question doesn't include uh, the salivary glands as answer choices. Instead, it's talking about the salivary ducts, which is where these calcifications tend to occur. So we have to find the one that correlates to the submandibular gland. So if we go through these answer choices one at a time, the Stenson's duct has to do with the parotid gland, so that is not correct. Bartholin's duct is part of the ducts of Rivenus, which have to do with the sublingual gland, that's also incorrect. 
and the von Ebner's glands are glands found in a trough circling the circumvallate papillae on the dorsal surface of the tongue near the terminal sulcus. And although it has to do with the tongue and taste buds, although the bad taste might tempt you to pick this answer choice, the source of that bad taste is the sialolith, and this has nothing to do with calcifications in a salivary gland duct. So we're going to rule that one out as well. Wharton's duct does connect to the submandibular gland, and so that is the correct answer. The submandibular gland is, is also responsible for producing the majority of our saliva. All right, question number 11. Which skull suture do you expect has fused early in this patient? Go ahead, pause the video, and then we'll go over this together. So here we have an eight-year-old male. His parent says, uh, my child has an underbite, and I'm concerned about his adult teeth not coming in. And current findings include frontal bossing of the skull, hypertelarism, increased distance between the eyes, proptosis, which is bulging eyes, and a hypoplastic or a retrusive maxilla. They're currently in primary dentition with multiple impacted permanent teeth. So really the first part of solving this puzzle is figuring out this child's diagnosis. And all these findings together point towards a syndrome being Cruzon syndrome. Now the second half of this puzzle is determining the suture involved in early fusion. Now Cruzon's patients present with brachycephaly. That's a short skull anteroposteriorly, which we talked about when we talked about skull sutures. So it makes sense that a suture that runs horizontally would most likely be involved in a craniosynostosis that results in a short AP or anteroposterior skull. So the only one of these that runs uh, horizontally is the coronal suture. And the coronal suture is, in fact, the one that tends to fuse early in these Cruzon and Apert uh, patients. And so we can see here, again, from our, our drawing, that the frontal or metopic, the sagittal, and the squamous sutures all run in a, from this view, a vertical direction. And the coronal is the only one that runs in a horizontal direction, which is going to prohibit the skull from expanding along that axis. So the coronal suture is the correct answer for this question. All right, question number 12. Which of the following structures does not border the infected fascial space? Go ahead, pause the video, and then we'll talk, talk about this one together. So here we have a 25-year-old male. His face is swollen, and he cannot open his mouth. This is called trismus. And his previous dentist inadvertently used a contaminated needle and infected a fascial space during an inferior alveolar nerve block. So this is interesting. That has resulted in trismus and lateral facial swelling. And so which of the following structures does not border the infected fascial space? Well, what we have to first know is which fascial space is infected. And the one that's typically involved with an inferior alveolar nerve block is the pterygomandibular space. Now if we draw our diamond, this is my shortcut for the... Um, masticator spaces. And so we have the zygomatic arch here, we have the mandible that goes down here, we have the skull right up here, and we have a couple of uh, muscles of mastication. We have the masseter muscle, the medial pterygoid, the lateral pterygoid, and the temporalis. And so the space that we're really interested in is again the pterygomandibular space, which is located between the lateral pterygoid muscle and the mandible. And so which of the following structures does not border that infected fascial space? Well, we just talked about, we have the mandibular ramus, we have the lateral pterygoid muscle, and we have the medial pterygoid muscle. And so we can rule out medial pterygoid, we can rule out lateral pterygoid. Now, the interesting thing is, we said mandibular ramus because that's the vertical part of the mandible, but the mandibular body is located too far down and it's not 
uh, involved in this fascial space back you can think back where we're doing an inferior alveolar nerve block the body is located too far forward and down for comprehensiveness sake let's talk about every single boundary of this pterygomandibular space again superiorly we have the inferior head of the lateral pterygoid laterally we have the uh, medial surface of the mandibular ramus medially we have the medial pterygoid muscle Posteriorly, we have the deep part of the parotid gland, and anteriorly, we have the pterygomandibular raphae. And so the parotid gland is, in fact, a deep or posterior um, boundary for this space. The mandibular body is not. It's actually the mandibular ramus. So pretty challenging question here, but the correct answer for which of the following does not border the pterygomandibular space is the mandibular body. And here's that diagram that I was drawing before. All right, question number 13. Now, the following uh, three questions all have to do with the same case. So this is a, a classic example of a case set where you're given one patient and then several questions concerning that single patient. So you decide to conduct a cranial nerve exam for this patient. First, you ask her to follow your finger with her eyes, making sure to test for full range of motion of each eye. Which of the following cranial nerves have you not tested? So go ahead, uh, read through this, this question, the patient box, and then um, we'll go over it together. Okay, so here we have a 60-year-old female. She hasn't been to the dentist in a while, and she has a history of Bell's palsy. So that's uh, facial paralysis on one side of the face. So a cranial nerve exam might be a good idea to ch test her range of motion and see what's going on. So for this first part of the cranial nerve exam, we're asking her to follow our finger. So she's moving the pupils of her eyes up and down, left and right, and we're testing for a complete full range of motion. So the cranial nerves here, three, oculomotor, four, and six, are all controlling extraocular eye muscles. Three are, is controlling most of those muscles. And then we have our SO4 LR6, so superior oblique and lateral rectus. Now, the trigeminal nerve, not involved in this. It's involved in uh, sensation of the face. We have some tongue innervation going on. And so this is not involving the um, activity of the eye. So the answer for this first question of the case set is C. Now I might even make the argument that this test of testing their full range of motion of the eye really doesn't test uh, the cranial nerve two either, that's the optic nerve. That would be done with a field of view test and a visual acuity test like you'd have at the eye doctor where you have to read certain letters from a certain distance. And so, uh, my point for bringing that up is that if one of the answer choices was cranial nerve 2, I probably would select that as the correct answer as well because this specific test is not really testing the activity of cranial nerve 2 specifically. It's more focusing on the actual muscle movements of the eye. Can both eyes accurately move in both in all directions? So the answer for this first one is C. Then the second question for the case is, next you ask the patient to say ah and observe movement at the soft palate. Which of the following cranial nerves are you testing now? Go ahead, pause the video, and then we'll go through this together. So motor movement of all soft palate muscles except the tensor veli palatini is controlled by the vagus nerve. So the answer to this one is going to be cranial nerve 10, the vagus nerve. Now, if we go through the incorrect choices, the facial nerve does facial expressions, which are not relevant here. The glossopharyngeal nerve is responsible for the sensory gag reflex, but not motor movements of the soft palate when you're saying something like ah. So that's also incorrect. And the hypoglossal nerve does activate when you say ah, if you stick your tongue out like at the doctor's office, but that has to do with tongue movement, not soft palate movement, which the question stem points out. So we're looking for a soft palate vibration, 
which is activated by cranial nerve 10 or the vagus nerve. And finally, you ask the patient to shrug their shoulders. Which of the following cranial nerves are you testing now? Go ahead, pause the video, and then we'll go through this together. All right, so for this last question, the main muscle that shrugs the shoulder is the trapezius muscle. And it's one of the two muscles that's innervated by the spinal accessory nerve, which is cranial nerve 11. So the answer for this final question of these practice questions is D. All right, so how'd you do? Let me know in the comments. I know some of these questions were pretty challenging. I definitely uh, didn't make it easy on you guys. So hopefully, um, don't get discouraged if you got a couple wrong. These are pretty you know, accurate in terms of what you might see on the board exam. So take it as a learning experience and keep at it and keep studying and you'll do really, really well. So that's it for this video, guys. Thank you so much for watching. Please like this video if you enjoyed it and subscribe to this channel for more on dentistry. If you're interested in supporting this channel and what I do, please check out my Patreon page. Thank you to all of my patrons for all of their support. You can unlock extras like access to my video slides to take notes on and practice questions for the board exams. So go check that out. The link will be in the description. Thanks again for watching everyone, and I'll see you in the next video.